how can you build a metropolitan city on a sandbar? With the highest elevation of only 8 feet above sea level, in the middle of Hurricane Alley. Well, Galvestonians did it. shall not overflow you. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, O oh Lord. Decades before the 1900 storm, Galvestonians began wondering if they should protect their city from hurricanes. Conversations around building a seawall had been around since at least 1886, right after the city of Indianola, Texas was wiped off the map by a massive hurricane. Before the 1900 storm, the city of Galveston decided against building a seawall. It would have been costly. Although Galveston had been struck by hurricanes before, Meteorologists believed that Galveston was not susceptible to a massive destructive hurricane due to weather patterns and Galveston's location on the Gulf Coast. This, of course, was not true. In a previous episode, I covered five major infrastructure projects to help protect Galveston Island from future hurricanes after the devastating 1900 storm, the Galveston Seawall. The Seawall was a magnificent engineering feat, but it was only part of the solution recommended by the Board of Engineers. To talk about the Galveston Seawall without talking about the grade raising is a crime. One critical project that I did not cover in that episode was the grade raising of Galveston Island, an absolutely massive infrastructure project that deserves its own video. Let's take a look at the grade raising of Galveston. Welcome to Galveston Unscripted. Thank you to our video sponsor, The Daily News bringing you the news since 1842. Texas oldest newspaper. Support your local newspaper, The Daily News. Before the 1900 storm, Galveston was a booming metropolitan city, one of the richest in the United States per capita. Throughout the 1880s and 1890s, thanks to its port and emerging beach tourism industry, Galveston was on pace to become one of the major economic hubs in the southern United States. Galveston was able to grow its economy and populace at an astonishing clip with a population of about 37,000 by 1900. But after the 1900 storm struck Galveston, killing between 6 and 8,000 of its residents and destroying much of the city, the city of Galveston was preoccupied with its recovery effort, leaving room for another city and port to dominate the Texas economy, the city and port of Houston. The seawall was built to protect Galveston from future hurricanes and the massive waves that those storms can produce but the engineers building the seawall knew that that would not be enough to protect Galveston Island. After the completion of the Galveston seawall, Galvestonians embarked on an ambitious project to raise the grade of the entire city, essentially elevating the island, as it was low-lying and still vulnerable to storm surge and flooding despite the seawall's protection. The initial grade-raising project was only designed to elevate Galveston Island behind the initial seawall project, from about 6th Street to 39th Street. This initial project took between 1903 and 1912, but throughout the early 20th century, 
Grade raising projects took place all throughout the urbanized portion of Galveston Island. Most of Galveston's east end has been elevated at least a few feet above sea level. Before this project, the elevation of Galveston Island was modest. Galveston Island is an extremely low-lying barrier island, averaging around five to six feet above median low tide. After the project, the elevation varied significantly, ranging from eight feet along the bay side and at its highest point up to 22 feet, right behind the 17-foot high Galveston seawall. This extensive and costly endeavor was financed by the taxpayers and individual property owners on Galveston Island. In December of 1903, work began on the grade raising. The first challenge was sourcing the material for the fill. Taking sand from the beach was not an option, as sand is what protects the footings of the seawall, keeping it intact. And transporting dirt from the mainland would be both a logistical and financial nightmare. Where did all the sand come from? Engineers from New York, Gatehart and Bates, came up with an innovative solution. Bates, a dredge designer involved in the Panama Canal project, proposed digging a canal across the island. The sand excavated from this canal could be used to raise the land behind the seawall, where the heaviest filling was required. In order to complete two projects at once, dredges could take sand from the bottom of Galveston Bay, mainly between the Galveston jetties at the entrance to Galveston Bay, navigate the canal, and discharge it on Galveston Island, simultaneously raising Galveston Island and removing the sand from between the jetties, deepening the ship channel. Four dredges were used in this process. This canal was three miles long, 20 feet deep, and 200 feet wide. It allowed two dredges to pass each other easily. The canal started at 8th Street and stretched across what is now Harborside Drive, curved around behind the seawall, and followed Avenue P and a half to 33rd Street. A turning basin was built between 13th and 15th Street, and at 33rd Street, leaving space for these barges to easily turn around to go pick up more sand. Hopper dredges filled themselves with sand, navigated up the canal, and discharged the loads of sand through an intricate network of pipelines laid throughout the island. This massive undertaking temporarily displaced several thousand houses and cut off the eastern portion of the island. Residences situated within the canal's proposed path were temporarily relocated to either side. A levee was built around each section that was going to be raised, and giant pipes began pumping in salt water and sand gradually raising each levied section. While roaming around Galveston Island, you may notice that some of the homes on the island are elevated and not sitting directly on the ground. Some of these homes may be three to six feet off the ground, a very beneficial height to keep floodwaters out of the house. This is a very common sight on the east end of Galveston Island. Some of these homes may even be sitting on the same stilts that they were elevated on during the Galveston grade raising over a hundred years ago. When the grade raising commenced, Officials would come out and mark the proposed height of the grade raising on an electrical or telephone pole. This would let the homeowners on that block know exactly how high the grade was to be elevated. In other words, this line showed where the new ground level would be. Galveston homeowners began to put their homes on stilts, elevating them above the newly proposed grade. The island required varying fill heights with some areas barely raised at all. There are two reasons behind this. The seawall needs a lot of support to withstand the powerful waves of a hurricane, so the highest elevations on the island are right behind the seawall, as the grade slowly slopes downward as you move towards Galveston Bay. This, in theory, lets water drain off of Galveston Island. If the elevation was raised to be completely flat, it would be difficult for water to drain. Not to mention, most buildings in downtown Galveston were not elevated, as many of them are very heavy and complex structures. Homes were not the only structures to be raised on Galveston Island. Massive buildings, like churches, were elevated as well, including St. Patrick's Church on 34th and K. It was raised five feet, using 700 jack screws and 100 men over 35 days. Despite weighing 3,500 tons, men would slowly crank hand-turned jack screws, similar to a car jack today, elevating the church a half inch at a time. The same story goes with the Letitia Rosenberg home on 25th Street and Trinity Episcopal Church on 22nd Street. But you can really tell the brick line here is different because when they raised the grade in 1925, they put in the newer brick underneath. Mm -hmm. And you all know how the grade raising was done, that there were guys who had dug under the church with jacks and were jacking the church up while another guy banged a drum so that it would all go up at the same time and not crack the church. 
an amazing story. Down into the crypt. Look at that brick. Oh my goodness. This is, I mean, breathtaking. It's really amazing. Just a from the, the history of the building, that the headstone used to be flush with the floor. But during the grade raising, it created this vault space here. And you can see then th this is where they put in so many of the, the pipes and wires and, and all of that for the rest of the church. After the 1900 storm, they raised the grade of the island by pulling in dredge fill. And they didn't do it in the cemetery district at that time. So during the 1920s, they did three separate grade raisings. And every time they did a grade raising, they would tell people, if you pay us, we'll lift your family's monument and set it back down. But of course, entire families were wiped out or moved away, so they couldn't afford it. And they got buried over time. Now this one I've dug to the base. It goes down about another four feet, and the names are still perfectly clear on the side. Some of them were raised, a lot of them weren't, but the ones that looked like they were sinking were just covered by the grade. Here, because of the grade raisings and vandalism and weather, if you look at a ground penetrating radar, it looks like somebody has just dropped a bunch of dominoes. Oh my gosh. They're all over the place. Throughout this transformative process, life in Galveston carried on. People continued to reside in their elevated homes, accessing their houses via boardwalks and bridges. The unusual sight of suspended homes and elevated walkways became a common scene in Galveston. Once the grade raising operation was complete, the canal was dammed at intervals and refilled. The displaced houses were then moved back to their original sites. The newly filled land on Galveston Island was extremely sandy. After all, it had been pulled from the bottom of the ship channel. The streets were graded and paved or bricked over, and railway tracks were then relayed. This monumental project reached its final stages in 1928, completely transforming Galveston's landscape. Most of the greenery trees on Galveston Island had been killed by the saltwater inundation from the 1900 storm. And if that wasn't enough, all of the sand and saltwater brought onto the island from the grade raising would have killed any greenery not transplanted to the topsoil. The grade raising killed most of the trees spared by the storm by smothering their roots with sand and salt water which need oxygen just like humans do. Many of the mature trees we see thriving on Galveston Island today, like the large oak trees that we take for granted, were planted after the grade raising. The Women's Health Protective Association brought in and planted thousands of new trees and shrubs, including oak trees and Galveston's own oleander. But there is at least one oak tree on the island that survived the 1900 storm and the Galveston grade raising, the Borden Oak located at 35th and Avenue K. Thanks to Mr. Thomas Borden, brother of Gail Borden, famous for inventing condensed milk. According to family stories, the Borden Oak was on Thomas Borden's property, and he protected it during the island's grade raising. Borden saved the oak by creating a levee around it during the grade raising operation, leaving an open space for the oak tree's roots while the land around it was filled in. Fresh water was brought in often to minimize any damage done by salt water. Over the following years, the open space around the tree was gradually filled in with soil, and the roots were slowly covered, leaving the tree's original base five feet below the current soil surface. Raising Galveston's grades stands as one of Texas' great civic projects. Despite the challenges, the people of Galveston chose to invest time, money, and effort to secure their city's future. Their determination ensured that Galveston would not only survive, but prosper leaving a lasting legacy for future generations. The 1900 storm and Galveston's recovery marked the beginning of this ambitious project, which has ultimately saved lives and property for well over 100 years. Galveston is like an old painting. It has layers and layers of history, from its homes, its people, and even the soil under our feet. Needless to say, Galveston has never been the same since the 1900 storm. But I thank those who came before us who sought to prevent another disaster like the 1900 storm, and those that fought to keep this island a city that stands out. Without those monumental efforts, would Galveston still be on the map? Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Galveston Unscripted.